Good evening. Good evening. This is the Tuckahoe Town Meeting for September 23rd, 2020. Your new police chief. Um, I'm going to welcome you tonight. Those of you online, welcome to. Uh, if you're online, real quick, if you're online, look to the uh, right of your screen. And you can get your questions there. Or if you want to send an email to me, it's pob at patobannon.com. <laughs> That's okay. Um, this evening, uh, we are uh, going to have an interesting discussion. But before we get started, we have a couple of notable people here. We have the delegate from the 73rd Health District, Rodney Willett. And we have the candidate for the 72nd District, Chris Holmes, Christopher Holmes. He's here also. So thank you for coming. And um, if you are going to speak and ask a question, please talk into the microphone over there. Because since we are recording this and we are live on air, um, they can't hear your questions unless you have a, um, a microphone. Now, this evening, we're going to have a great presentation from our new chief of police, Eric English. He holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and sociology from the University of Richmond, go Spiders, <laughs> and a master's degree in public administration for, from Virginia Commonwealth University, go Rams. <laughs> On September 14th, 2020, so just about one year ago, uh, English was sworn in as the Henrico County Chief of Police. Prior to joining the division, he served with the City of Richmond Police Department from 1989 to 2018, rising through the ranks to become Deputy Chief of Operations in 2011 and Deputy Chief of Support and Business Services in 2016. In September 2018, he was named Chief of Police of the Harrisonburg Police Department, located in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Chief English is a graduate of the Senior Management Institute for Police at Boston University and is a certified law enforcement instructor. He's a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the Virginia Association of Poli Chiefs of Police, and is president of the Central Virginia Chapter of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. A sports enthusiast, he played basketball for the University of Richmond and was a member of the Spiders Sweet 16 team of 1988. His reputation has preceded him on that. Often get people say, who's that? He's a Spider, but he also played in, in uh, Sweet 16. He went on to coach and officiate youth basketball in the community for many years. Chief English has been a Henrico County resident for more than 30 years. He and his wife have two adult children and are the proud grandparents of two grandchildren. Also with us tonight is our community officer for Tuckahoe. We have two. This is Officer Andrew Butler. He's back there in the back of the room. And if you want to know what a community officer does, I've often called community officers for various things. There was a gentleman who was standing in, in the road and he only had his underwear on and it was obvious that he had some, uh, a mental condition or he really needed help. I called the community officer and air officers are well trained in handling uh, mental situations. Another time I had two neighbors who were arguing, arguing about where their line was between their homes. One had planted a, a shrub right on the line and the other neighbor picked it up and threw it in the yard and they called me and wanted me to come and mediate. I called the community officer. <laughs> That's what they do. They work with the community, they know the community and they meet people in the community. And it's very easy to talk to them. And if you need help to a certain level, I will call the community officer. Here is police, Chief of Police Eric English to do a great presentation for us about what he's done in the first year of his being here. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you, Ms. O'Bannon. And again, thank you all for being here. Be here and just kind of talk a little bit about what's been going on in the right. Ms. O'Bannon mentioned, assuming roles 
September of last year, 2020, just past my one year anniversary in rifle. Quickest first year I've ever been in our policing career. Same things just seemed to really pass by very quickly, and there was a lot, lot to be done. There was a lot done in that first year, so there's a lot more work to be done. But I just want to kind of give you kind of an overview of some of the things that have taken place over the last 12 months. So uh, coming into the division, one of the things I kind of harped on when I took over was I wanted to talk, be a little more transparent and compared to where we have been in the past, and also talk a lot about community engagement. So one of the things that I wanted to do coming in is to making sure that citizens or, or, or people in Henrico County or anybody can look up on our website and kind of see what is Enrico doing. What what does their arrest data look like? What does their traffic stop data look like? What does their use of force data look like? All those things in terms of school data. I wanted to make sure that individuals knew what the county was doing. So we included that data on our website. So you can go on, as you can tell, where we have been arresting people, who we've been arresting, those type of things in particular areas, uh, different um, districts. So that is all on our website. You can break it down by demographic. Crash data is also on the website. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, anybody could go on and kind of get an idea. We also wanted to put our workforce data on the website as well. Harp a lot on vision during what the community was doing. So we wanted to make sure that people understood where we, where we stand currently. Work to be done. And so I wanted to make sure that everybody understood what we broken it down by citizens warned, civilians, also broken it down by our communications officers and our animal protection officers. It's also a part of our division. We can go on there and kind of get an idea of what our division is doing. Another, another item that's on the website as well is internal affairs complaints, our statistics concern, uh, concerning uh, complaints made both externally and internally. I would tell you that we actually have more internal complaints than external complaints. That goes to accountability for us. So a lot of times you will make a complaint against an officer. A lot of times what we're doing is we're somebody on camera video, uh, see something that's just out of place and just not right. Our policies and procedures. And so it's not just individuals complaining about us, but we're also trying to make sure we're managing ourselves. We want to make sure people the last thing I will say, uh, well, one of the other things I will say about the division is we talk about police policy. Our policy, uh, we've revamped a lot of our policies. We've created new policies. We'll talk a little bit about some of those. We wanted to make sure that our policies were on our website. Most of what we do in law enforcement is not a secret. Uh, so you should be able to understand what are our guiding principles in terms of what we should be doing with these policies. So we made those. Uh, we Posted many of those, our policies online currently. Update those, make changes to those. I wanted to make sure people are aware of that as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the policies that have been updated, give you an idea of some of the changes that have been made. So our code of conduct. So we revamped our code of conduct, and what we did was we basically created a matrix. So what that does is it allows Internally and externally, individuals kind of get an understanding of following a certain policy. The range of discipline could be A, B, C, D. Whereas before, I think in, within the division, many of our, our personnel didn't really have a clue of if they violated a policy of what they were going to get. Uh, and so a lot of times people felt like, you know, punishment may be of just arbitrarily given out. And so they didn't have an understanding of what it was like. So we created this matrix. So what that does is gives not only our internal personnel an opportunity to see if you violate a policy, which it could be, but it also gives individuals in the community an opportunity to see what the range of punishment could be to sustain complaints. So if you make a complaint, we send you a letter back and we say, you know, found out a policy. Normally, that's all you would get. We're kind of, kind of paraphrasing what the letter says, but that's all you get. But now you can say, where well, it's out of policy for this violation. Now let me go on the website and see what the range of 
gives you a little bit more insight into what has been done, and it goes it goes to show that we are trying to hold people responsible. Um, I created a disciplinary review manager position, so that's the individual that determines the level of discipline for policy violation. Or there was a lot of I'll say a lot of hands in the pot in making that decision on what to do. So if you got so many people trying to make a decision on discipline, uh, as I told my staff, we all think a little bit differently. So you don't get a lot of consistency out of people. And that's it. And I wanted to make sure that we come to an individual, we have to look at the matrix and see where it falls. And again, there's a lot of other things that are taken into consideration. But you know, what is the person's disciplinary history? You know, how long have they been on the job? All those things come into play. But it does allow us to be more focused on making sure that we're consistent in what we're doing. So uh, that, that position has been in place, and we've been using it for three months. Conduct. Disciplinary policy, uh, even, our, even our old policy, you know, as many people seem to think that police always take care of one another, and we never do anything to, to, uh, to our police officers that they're in the that's, that's far from the truth. I've been two, two and three years in the city of Miami. There have been several others that have been suspended for, for violations of policy. Again, that's not something that, I, that I'm trying to get up here and pound my chest about because I don't like to do those things. But the bottom line is you got to be, when you face consequences and actions, you got to make sure that we're holding people step out of line. I mentioned accountability and The other part is I talked about that the letter process on a letter. We try to make sure that we uh, they don't get an idea that we just brushed it under the rug. Said, All right, they're out of line. No, don't do that. Another one of the policies is body worn camera, which you all know is a huge issue. There's a lot of legislation going around now and in, uh, in across the across the country. Uh, well, where they're trying to, where they're mandating body worn cameras for agencies. And Rico County was one of the first agencies main body worn cameras we've been using for a while. And one of the things I wanted to make sure we're doing is uh, our policy kind of coincides with what's going on in, current, in our current climate. One of the things I wanted to change was when we turn the body worn cameras off, on, and when we turn them off. So what I what I was experiencing when I first got here and reviewed the body worn camera. That I would have individuals that would pull up on a scene and would miss the first 30 seconds of the conversation. So, if you are familiar with how body worn cameras work, the first 30 seconds when you turn up, you turn off those and you don't hear any sound. You can see what's going on, but you can't hear anything. So, I always say all the conversation is when you turn off. And so, what I, what I proposed in our policy is that I wanted them to turn the camera on before they got on the call. That way, when you get there, you're capturing everything. Not only what's going on, but you're capturing the sound and everything. The other part of that is the last thing I wanted my officers worrying about is the scene is turning on body on camera. Because you don't never know what you what, what what's going to happen. You pull up on a call, you might have to jump into action right away. The last thing I want you worrying about is trying to turn a camera on. So turn it on before you get there. You don't have to worry about it. So we, we, we created that, revamped that policy. Then the other part of it is goes back to accountability as well. You know, I just I, I've, I've asked my supervisors to take a look at two two videos of their employees, uh, two videos a month, just a random audit, looking at their videos. One to making sure folks are turning it on and off when they should, but also making sure they don't see anything that's out of pocket in terms of, in terms of how our officers are acting. So I wanted to make sure that we're doing that because again, it goes back to accountability and making sure that we're doing things by our by our citizens. So. That, that, was a, that was a huge policy change for us, and, and body-worn cameras are extremely important. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we see a, we see a violation uh, aggressive. We don't just let those things just go by just because nobody made a complaint. Uh, that's something we just can't allow. So we always try to address those things. The other one is use of force. Policy, which we had a very, very solid policy. We had solid before we got here. The only thing I added in the policy was the uh, that sentence, the preservation of life is of uh, importance in any use of use of force. And all, uh, I added that because I want our, our folks to understand that we got to do everything we can to try to preserve life. Uh, now again, unfortunately in this business, there are times when life's life is taken. 
but you got to make sure that you do it. Yeah, we understand your life is important, so we're going to do everything we can to try to to try to not get ourselves in a situation. Uh, the other one is the pursuit policy. These are, you know, all these things I'm talking about are high liability issues. So we talk about pursuit policy. We kind of modify what we can use a pit. And uh, those that don't know what a pit is, you know, that's when a police car kind of taps the back of a back of a vehicle to get it to stop. Kind of spins it out. Uh, I'm sure you, you've seen it, whether you've seen it on TV or not. It happens at a high speed, very dangerous. So we don't do pits at, at high speed. But even at low speeds, I want to make sure that we're pitting individuals and using it for the right purpose. What I mean by that is that it needs to be something that's very serious because again, even at low speeds, even though you can do it safely, it might not be the appropriate thing to do. So I wanted to make sure that we had in, uh, in our policy to make sure you're using the pit at the, the right reasons, not for not for a minor violation where somebody runs through a stoplight and takes off and you get in a pursuit for that. Okay, the only thing you know is that they ran a red light. That may not necessarily be a reason for somebody to pit unless they go on and doing something extremely crazy that uh, is creating a, a situation where it's very, very dangerous for that individual to continue to, to, uh, to travel down our roadway. So I wanted to make sure we uh, modified that. Uh, and then we have a, a, a school MOU, a memorandum of understanding with our schools. We work very well with our with our school and uh, Dr. Cashwell, and we, we revamped the uh, MOU. We really, really clarify what the role is of our they do an outstanding job at our schools. We know what we're trying to do is making sure that we don't have to guard ourselves in school. Very serious situations that are not because the kid is acting up, not because they won't turn itself. No, that is not our role. So we wanted to make sure in our MOU that was very clear. Also had our SROs go through some school training uh, with the administrators and teachers right before the school year started. Long training right before school. We feel very comfortable and confident what our roles are in schools. Right now. And a couple other policy changes, personal appearance and grooming standards. Uh, when I got here, the, uh, oh, Henrico has a tattoo policy. We had a tattoo policy. We still have a, still do have a tattoo policy. But one of the things I, I encountered one of my employees, and first thing I noticed was they had a sleeve on their arm. I didn't know if it was, you know, or what have you, but I asked them, I said, you know, why do you have a sleeve? And she said, well, she said, well, we have a tattoo, I have to cover it up. So that was part of our policy, that you had to cover your tattoo. Uh, my thought process on this, uh, we're bringing individuals into this organization, many of them straight out of college. I just don't know too many college students that don't have a tattoo. And so my thought process was, you know, if people are calling for help, if you call them help and you need help, I think the last thing you're probably worried about is whether that officer responds to that has a tattoo on their arm. So my thing is I don't want to eliminate folks from being great officers and eliminating that pool of officers just because we have a tattoo policy. So I loosen that up. You know, you no longer have to wear a sleeve. I mean, your tattoo has to be presentable. It can't be something that's derogatory, racist, or whatever. It has to be something that's in anyone. But at the same time, uh, I think it loosens, like I said, it loosens up and making sure we don't knock anybody out of the process and become. Then we also we're looking at a different uniform, the outer carry vest. This is what tell you the vest we currently have because you, you inside it can be very very hot, especially in some of the months we've had, heat we've had in some of these summer months. And so we're looking at an outer carry that makes it more comfortable for officers. I told them I could care less what I wear, but I want my officers to be comfortable. Looking out of use one that be a little less cost, a little less costly than what we currently. Have. So those are things that we're looking at for. Recruitment standards were changed a little bit in terms of the pool of applicants. Modify some of our automatic disqualifiers, and so we want to make sure we're looking at the whole person, not just a small period of time for that individual. And so what I what I impart on people is that somebody at the age of 21 may not be the same. So you can't look at, you know, somebody that may have something meaning back a little bit at age 21, 31, that's just not feasible. So I want to make sure we're looking at the whole person and not automatically disqualify people because of a, a hiccup they may have supply. Uh, marijuana usage, too many of you know marijuana became legal at for certain amounts. Uh, we reduced the 
marijuana from couldn't have used it in the last two years when I first got here. We used it in the last 12 months. So, in order to become a police officer, you cannot use have used marijuana in the last 12. Months. Then we modified the age. You had to be 21 to start the academy. Uh, I modified it to 20 and a half because technically you can be 20 and a half to start the academy as long as you're 21 by the time you graduate the academy. Good to go. So we modified that as well. Some of the groups that I created, it was, but this group was already created when I got here. This uh, chief's advisory group. What I did was I just added a few more people to the group. So it's made up of seven members, all citizen of, citizens of Enrico County. What they do is we have some very candid conversations. We meet once a month, talk about some of the issues that are going on in law enforcement. We talk about some of the issues that are going on in Enrico County. Uh, and when I started developing our discipline policy, I actually gave them a copy of the policy as we were in draft. And so they took a look at it, gave me some ideas. They talked about some of the things they would like to see in the policy. So they helped, they actually helped me craft the uh, other part of it is that they all, uh, most of them have participated in ride-alongs. So it gives them a little more insight into what officers are doing on a daily basis. Many of them gave us some, some great feedback on the ride-alongs. And so they were really, really surprised at some of the things that they saw out in the community. They also went through the uh, our, our shoot no shoot simulator. Many of them took the opportunity to do that as well, and it gives them a little more insight into what officers are dealing with on a daily basis and some of the split second decisions that have to be made. The part of it is that we have set we have sat down and we've actually reviewed everybody on camera video every month. So I don't just show them the good parts about what we do; I show them the bad parts about what we do. So. We've had some really good conversations about those things. As we step out of line, we try to Another group I created was the Use of Force Review Board. Major, Bar Major Doug Barker is actually in charge of that board. He, uh, he has a captain, a lieutenant, a sergeant. There's a peer member on the board. And there's also two citizens on the board. What they do is they look at every use of force incident that we have. Now, we are self-reporters of use of force. So most of the time, a use of force is reported by the individual that has to use of force. Most of the time, our use of force is maybe trying to pull away doing an arrest. We have to take them down to the ground. Those type of things are what we do a use of force. We, have to be, we are self-reporters of those. So now this board will look at each of those to make a determination whether we were in policy or out of policy. All they're trying to determine. If we find somebody out of policy, that would go to our disciplinary review manager. So gives, they will take a look at the packet. They will look at the body work camera video in order to make that determination. Again, I'm trying to include citizens in this so they have so they have some some buy-in and say as to what is what is right and what is wrong. And as I mentioned, uh, they don't they are only looking at in or out of policy and not trying to determine what the what the discipline should be. Then just a couple of new strategies we talked uh, that, that community walks we started this about three months ago. Three months ago, uh, walked uh, community in Farallon. Community uh, St. Luke's, we walked to St. Luke's and walked in the community over in Lakeside. Uh, those are the, the three that we've done thus far this year. Technically, we're supposed to have one next week. Uh, canceling that one just because we understand the COVID cases are rising and we, we felt like we needed to take a pause on it. So we will kick those off when appropriate. But one of our things is we try to do is choose a neighborhood each and every month, go door to door trying to determine what we can do to better serve that community. Each community is different. So we will try to make sure we get information from that community, gathering data of what we can do to go back in that community and make it better. What we try to do is follow up with that community, let them know what we've done, address the issues that they bring to us, and make sure that we're doing all that we can in order to build relationships with that community. Now, again, one of the things I've implemented too will recruit. We have our recruits, some of our recruits that will walk with us in those cities doing those community walks. Uh, twofold. One, I want recruits getting familiar with the areas that they're going to be policing. 
Secondly, we know younger generation, sometimes the communication skills are not what it used to be for us because they do a lot through technology. So I want them to start talking a lot for our community members. Two for for me, it's a great experience for them. Then what our community wants is not just us. We have other county agencies that are participating with us. The fire department is out there with us. Development sometimes is out there with us. But we have different entities that walk with us because a lot of times when we're asking individuals in the community, a lot of times it's not a police issue. So we try to make sure we are inclusive in uh, in county. And then just to talk a little bit about legislative changes uh, and how they have affected us. So as many of you know, marijuana, legalization of marijuana uh, had, had some somewhat of an effect on the, on the police department. One, uh, retired some of our canines. Uh, several of our canines were uh, trained a dog. You can't untrain them to sniff marijuana. Train them to sniff marijuana, but you can't untrain them to sniff marijuana. You have to retire those canines. So we end up having to retire canines, purchase new ones, and train those dogs to get them get them ready to go. Uh, and as the, the cost associated with that, but again, we uh, we have done a great job in order to make that transition. Secondly, talk about officers. We had to really retrain our officers on on marijuana. Think about it. I started my career almost 32 years ago. All those times, you know, the smell of marijuana has always been a reason for search a car, probable cause to make an arrest, what have you. Try to undo that after all these years is transition for many of us. So we got to make sure that we're training individuals. We have we have done that. Commonwealth Attorney's Office has come in and actually taken classes on it, making sure everybody's familiar with what the new law says. Again, they restrict some of the questions you can ask. The smell doesn't mean anything. Sure, if you all like me, you all probably had a car that drove by you. The smell is very strong smell. Uh, I where I, I've had a car drive by me and I thought I think I had marijuana in my car. But again, because it's legal, there's nothing you can do to stop that car or do anything. Make sure people are then we just try to make sure we looked at our internal policies. Then traffic stops. As you know, the county, we do a lot of traffic enforcement within the county. And a lot of complaints about traffic. We, are, we try to make sure that we're in the right laws that individuals are complaining about. So some of the legislation kind of so in, in some in some ways hampers the, the ability for us to, to really enforce some of the things that people do. As you know, tenant windows are no longer primary offense. You can't stop somebody for just uh, brake light defects, tail light defects, not primary offenses, dangling objects. I'm okay with that. I, I never understood why that was in, in, in with. But you mentioned the smell of marijuana. Amounts are legal, but smell of marijuana is no longer far. Again, the exhaust system, I get calls about that, and people that send me emails about loud, loud exhaust system. Hampers our, our ability to do a good job. Then, as you, as you all know, ex expired regulatory inspection sticker that four months lag, so you get a So those are things that we, we are dealing with. A lot of times we're getting calls about some of these things. I just got an email not too long ago from an individual talking about you know, uh, about exhaust on on explained to him what the law was. Kind of charged it to him because there's not a whole lot we can do with the situation. So these are some of the things that we're dealing with in order to work around some things. And so again, we're gonna continue to use traffic enforcement as a tool to address some of the issues that are going on. Make sure everybody's kind of aware of what new legislation and what changes we have to make in how we operate. 
So as I mentioned, two, the two biggest complaints I get in the county currently, traffic and animals. That's two of the things that people complain about in Marietta County. Again, I'm not saying those are the two biggest things that we concentrate on, but uh, those are two of the things that we try to mitigate as best we can with traffic enforcement. There are a couple of things that we currently, gun violence, an uptick in gun violence in the county, especially 16 to 25 year olds. Many people are getting their hands on guns and they're not afraid to use that. So there's some areas within the county that we're working on to try to mitigate some of that. Other thing that I would say that's a huge problem for us is catalytic converter theft. We set a meeting earlier today talking about how we can address that issue. It doesn't take anybody long to, to slide up under their vehicle, cut the catalytic converter theft off, go get money for it, what have you. A lot of it is you know, drug habit uh, throughout the county. And it's not just a county issue. Richmond is experiencing it, Chesterfield, Hanover, all of us are experiencing So we try to work hard to try to try to resolve that issue. But I just want to make sure people are aware of that. Again, uh, buses, church vans, any vehicles you can really slide up under to really get a, get a catalytic converter very easy. Uh, targets of uh, about the county. Then the other thing is overdose deaths. Deaths and, and overdose death. That we this is very, very disheartening to see on a moment of day basis. I'm, I'm an overdose. Overdoses are on the charts this year. What we're seeing is that you have individuals that are overdosing. Naloxin. And bringing them back. Next thing you know, they're not seeking treatment. Of course, anybody to seek treatment. What ends up happening is that next time they do seek treatment, they end up dying. So very disheartening to see that occurring. That is, that is not a countywide issue, but a nationwide issue in terms of the So those are things that we're experiencing right, right now currently. Now some of the future problems I see for the profession huge, huge issue for us. I can tell you we're spending a lot of time with mental health. What I'm saying is we have to figure out a way to minimize law enforcement since it's a solid issue. I'm not saying law enforcement gets out of the business of mental health. What I am saying is that we have to minimize our We are spending a lot of time with mental health problems. What I mean by that is whether it's being transporting them, transporting them, or we're spending a lot of time at the hospital with them, either bed, on a bed, or treat. So I always say when an officer is at a hospital, there's, what they're actually doing is it's not an officer that's doing the work. It's an officer that's doing the treat. So we got to figure out a way in order to minimize that to get officers back on the road. I say we should be doing that. Those are, that, that's a huge issue. The other part of it is just hiring good qualified candidates. You all know people are not not banging on the door, knocking on the door, saying, I want to be the police. I have them. As in the years past, we're knocking on the door. But we're not getting as many applicants. It's just not. It's not what it used to be. So we got to figure out ways in order to entice people, to show them that it is a good I always tell people, want to be the change agent, you got to be in the game and sit on the sidelines. And so for those that want to get into the profession, we're trying to push that because they have an opportunity to do something great in this profession. So those are some of the future problems I see in the profession, but those are some of the things that we're going to continue to work on to try to make. So with that said, any questions? Question that earlier today that I thought was a good one. Um, our area is receiving uh, refugees from different different places. 
I know there are from, some from the Congo and some from Afghanistan. We have several families or to 80 families coming into the county that are Afghanistan from Afghanistan. Um, how does the police department handle something like that? Is, well, not even refugees necessarily, but when you come upon people who don't speak English very well. Yeah, so very, very good question. And I would say that for the most part, we, we have, a, we have several folk people in the organization that speak various languages. Now, does a language barrier present itself? Yes. On some calls that does happen. Uh, we do all we can in order to try to find somebody that can communicate with that individual. But the other part of that goes to recruitment. What we try to do is, you know, as we talk about trying to mirror our community, is it coming upon us to make sure we're trying to seek out individuals from various backgrounds, various ethnicities, to make sure that we are trying to, uh, trying to have people in the organization that look like that individual, look like that community, speak that language. Those things are extremely important. Now, I'm not saying we're going to, hire somebody that speaks every language that's spoken in Arrival County. But at the same time, there's, there's nothing wrong with us trying to shoot for a goal in order to increase the amount of people that speak various languages, just so that barrier is minimized. Uh, again, that's always going to happen. You're always going to have those language barriers. When I was in Harrisonburg, there was a very, very diverse community that spoke many, many different languages. Uh, I think there were 53 languages spoken in, in So you had a very diverse community. We ran into some of the same issues. It's no different here. Uh, we just try to make sure that we make sure we understand who within the organization can speak various languages and we, we utilize them to the best of our ability to make sure uh, we minim minimize any communication problems. Chief, I had uh, one, one comment and one, one question. Really good question, and I think there, uh, again, I always think sometimes when, when, when legislation comes forward, I see it in front of us, but I think some unintended consequences. Impairment is, is, is always a concern for us. Alcohol, there's a measurement. However, there are mechanisms that we age whether somebody's impaired. So you're able to make that determination uh, as to whether somebody, uh, I can't really tell you statistically what percentage of us. I would probably say there's probably not enough time anyway to make a determination of the percentage of increase associated with marijuana. But that is always a concern when it comes to that because, again, even though it's legal, certain amounts are legal, it doesn't mean that people drive after you when you So we got to make sure that we're sure that, again, that's why traffic enforcement is important for any record. That's what we do. Make sure we enforce it. Again, there are mecha mechanisms that we can. Very, very, very good question. I will say, uh, I de definitely understand the, the addiction, addiction piece of drugs. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, was, was we were trying to prevent is 
treating addiction like it's like it's a crime. And so we didn't want to incarcerate people uh, that had an addiction. One of the things incarceration did was it, it, it forced them to get some type of treatment. Uh, whether good or bad, whatever side of the aisle you're on and in terms of that. But what we do now is we, we, we can't make an arrest. And so what's happening is that folks that are overdosing are not seeking treatment. And so you can't force them to seek treatment. And so one of the things I always try to compare it to, and it might not be, a, might not be the right comparison, uh, but if somebody attempts suicide, we respond on that. We don't pat them on the back and say, all right, don't do that again and go home. We force somebody that attempts suicide to get treatment. And we can't do that with somebody that's, that's using illegal drugs and overdosing. And so for the most part, what we're seeing is individuals will go back and get that same drug, and then they're not making it. And so we're losing lives because we can't mandate that people get treatment. And so those are the, some, of the, some of the obstacles that we're running into. And it's, it's a sad situation that we're running into. And I, like I said, I understand the addiction piece, but, it, but it's also sad to see that people are not willing to take that step to go get treatment because you don't have whether it, whether it's the willpower to do it or it's just not right not the right time and you're putting it off but at the same time it's almost like playing russian roulette when you're going out and a lot of times you don't even know what's in those so we're seeing a, the, that that's where the spike is coming in at because before even though they they probably shouldn't have been in, incarcerated it, it was a, it was keeping them alive and it, it was Forcing them either the judges or somebody was forcing them to get some type of seek some type of treatment. So we're kind of at an impasse in terms of what, what do we do going forward? How do we prevent people from dying, but also how do we prevent people from uh, one question from online and it is actually for me. I might want to follow up on it, Chief, but says, have the board uh, members of the Board of Supervisors been advocating defunding the department? The answer to that is absolutely not. The number one th reason to um, have a local government is to provide public safety for the uh, people who live here. That is the police department and the fire department and everything else evolves or revolves around public safety. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have increased the funding to our police department to get training, special training that the chief was asking about. Uh, the other part of this, are we supporting the removal of qualified immunity? And I would say certainly the majority of our board absolutely not does not want to get rid of qualified immunity. And if for some reason at the state level it is removed, we have a, we've been discussing ways that we could support our officers. We, are, we have their backs, and that's probably the easiest way to put it. Um, but... Um, I've had this question before, and Chief, we did increase your um, budget this year. And I, I certainly appreciate it. And again, I, I guess it all depends on what you what you mean by defund. You know, again, there, there's many different definitions of what people consider defunding the police. But I would say this: we've been tasked with a lot of different in terms of what we're doing. So a lot of people feel like we need more training. Well, you can't get more training without dollars. Uh, so you know take dollars away from the police department, but you're, you're going to miss out on, you want it to be better, but you want to take away funding. I, I don't disagree that, you know, some responsibilities, don't get me wrong, because, you know, Delegate Willard just talked about it. Responsibilities, you know, especially when it comes to mental health, yeah, that, that should be going to other, other uh, entities in order to address that. Now, again, I'm not saying we are out of the business at all, I, completely, but we, we should be involved, but to, only to a certain degree. And so I do think there are some responsibilities that police are tasked with that we shouldn't be tasked with. Uh, and those, I'm not, I'm not saying take away dollars from us. I'm saying give dollars to the other entities in order to make sure they can address those. That's how I look at it. Uh, and so I, I do think we do a great job. Don't get me wrong. I think our, our division does an excellent job when it comes to mental health. Uh, we do a, a, an outstanding job of addressing those issues. We do an outstanding job of following up with individuals that are having uh, mental health crisis. Uh, but at the same time, there are other entities that should be addressing those. And so uh, I, I, I would just be, I would just caution people when they're asking and tasking us with doing so much more about saying, uh, let's take dollars away from police departments because there's so much more that we do outside of, outside of uh, what you see in normal.
Greg Baca, another UR Spider, go Spider. Um, thank you for all your staff. So, so many unsung heroes that we need. Question. Shared forces or what situations are Great question. Now, I would say the chiefs in the region, uh, we all work very well together. I have a really good relationship. I can pick up the phone and call any of them, uh, get a response or reply to whatever what our needs are. You know, if there's something that's that's going on in a particular county, needs in Rikos, Rikos assistance, we're going to help that locality. There's been many times we actually have needed help. Give you an example. Let's say let's say our SWAT team, but for whatever reason. Is down. Let's give an example. Let's say we have a COVID outbreak where none of our SWAT team members can come back to work. Uh, we would call on, you know, a locality to assist us. Say, you know, if there's anything major that's going down, can your SWAT team handle that? We we have those conversations with the chief. We come into an agreement. Uh, there's an email or a signed document that goes out to make sure they understand who's going to who's going to take care of that business for us. So we work well together in those. But we also work well, you know, even at, you know, it used to be, I would tell you, say, in, when I was even in Richmond, you know, the races, when the, when the raceway would come there, it was a joint operation. You know, you know Richmond officers that were working, uh, assisting with the races as well. Uh, we were helping uh, for in Richmond with the marathon. So, you know, there's always some, some uh, collaboration with, with other agencies that we're doing. And so, like I said, we have a really strong relationship with other chiefs and other departments. Uh, we're not going to let anybody angle and then receive the assistance they need. So uh, this is your question, but again. Great presentation. Thank you, Chief. Let's give him a round of applause for that. Um, Next month, we'll have another town meeting. We don't have a topic yet, so if you want to suggest one, let me hear it. <laughs> we try to pick uh, topics that are timely and are in the news, and this was one, particularly since our new chief has hit, is just celebrated his one-year anniversary. So thank you for coming, and I appreciate your time tonight, and great questions. Thank you again. Good evening.